Hello everyone and welcome to another lecture of computational algebraic geometry. So last lecture I promised to uh, talk about Grassmannians and here we will take it down a notch and start talking with the most important and the most basic Grassmannians. So these will be projective spaces and we will continue on to Grassmannians in the next week. Now the projective spaces well, are extremely important. They're sort of the ambient space of choice in algebraic geometry and here is that they're very easy uh, in terms of algebra. They're almost like an affine space. They have almost coordinates. And from these coordinates, you can cook up polynomials. So you're never too far away from polynomial algebra, just like the affine space. And compact objects behave so much better than objects that are not compact in terms of classifying or recognizing them. You realize that if you're not operating with a compact object, then what you're really doing is that you are first and foremost studying the compact object, uh, perhaps without realizing it, and in addition, the boundary that you are removing from it, even if you are not conscious about what this boundary is. And then the location of this boundary within your uh, geometric object is an extra data, and it can even be a transcendental data. So that is then an expensive notion to carry around, and this introduces extra complications. For this reason, what we want to do is to take objects, uh, so zero sets of polynomials in affine space, like Cn, Rn, Qn, and then um, compactify them. So what we do is that we put these affine spaces into a projective space, and then take the closure. So this is often called a projective closure. And then with a projective closure, our objects of study become simpler. I will demonstrate at the end of this lecture that the circle example that we have studied in the last week is a good example of how it, sim it is simplified once it's compactified. For example, over finite fields, when we were counting the number of points in the circle, there was a dichotomy about whether or not minus one was a quadratic residue modulo that prime. And depending on this, the number of points on the circle uh, was a different formula with regards to p, p minus one versus p plus one. And uh, you'll see that once we compactify the circle, or in the finite field case, once we projectivize it, well, that's a more appropriate way to say it, then uh, you'll see that there is a uniform formula for the number of points. It will always be p plus one for any p. There is no longer a dichotomy. And you understand that there was a boundary at infinity, and by adding this boundary back in, so this boundary was sometimes empty over fp, sometimes not, but once we've included this boundary, then this extra data that we were actually carrying around without knowing about it disappears, and then the answer becomes much simpler. Then this is the goal of this lecture. We want to study projective spaces and projective closure to basically master this uh, fundamental simplification and also to establish notation for future lectures. Let's begin with the definition of a projective space. Because we need to be flexible with this, let's uh, agree that K denotes a field. So this K can be the complex field, the real numbers, the rational numbers, finite fields, etc. And uh, I will usually say Kn or Kn plus one to denote the vector space dimension n, n plus 1, and that means in particular that there's a choice of basis for kn, and uh, that distinguishes it from an, an arbitrary vector space of dimension n. And of course n here is a positive integer that we fix throughout. What will play an important role here are one-dimensional subspaces of kn plus 1. So kn plus 1 is a vector space, so I want to take one-dimensional sub-vector spaces, in particular it's must pass through zero. The projective space of dimension n, or Pn, is, as I said, the set of lines or one-dimensional subspaces in Kn plus one. Of course, there's a natural geometric structure on this, so it's a, we call it the space of lines or the projective space, not just the set. Now let's unwind this definition a little bit. First of all, a one-dimensional subspace, let's call it a line, so a line is generated by any of its non-zero elements. So let's say my line is w inside of kn plus 1. And I take uh, any element, let's say omega inside of w, 
that is not zero. Then, of course, this recovers the line. Uh, moreover, I, any other non-zero element would have differed from my choice of omega by multiplication by a non-zero element in my field k. There is also the converse to this argument. If I were to take any non-zero element in kn plus 1, then of course this generates a one-dimensional subspace. Therefore, it gives me a line, therefore an element in pn. In the end, if you put these two arguments together, you realize that, at least as I said, pn can be viewed as the quotient group of the following. You take kn plus 1, you remove 0, and then you divide this out by k star, so the invertible elements in k. Of course, the bijection is uh, clear. So elements give you lines. From lines, you choose a generator. It gives you an element uh, up to multiplication by k star. This interpretation is also quite suitable for working with coordinates. So if I were to take any element, let's call it omega again, in kn plus 1, let's say it's not 0, then of course uh, I've had coordinates from the beginning. So this omega I can write down as omega 0, omega 1, etc. to omega n. So it's a tuple of numbers in k. And this thing defines a line. And I can just remember this tuple to represent my line. Usually there's a suitable notation where you use square brackets instead of parentheses to represent this tuple, and instead of commas you use columns. And then the thing to keep in mind is that this tuple, well it represents a point, but it does not uniquely, uh, is, this coordinate is not unique for the point that it represents, because I can scale this coordinate by any non-zero number. But, uh, in any case, the observation here is that if I write down an expression in these coordinates that is invariant under scaling, then I can talk about whatever that thing represents uh, uniquely. It will give me a well-defined expression. For example, often zero sets are very well-defined. An expression like the ith coordinate equals the jth coordinate is a well-defined expression because when I scale, I scale the ith and the j coordinate by the same constant and therefore this expression being equal makes perfect sense and this will cut out a locus in the projective space for example now uh, something to keep in mind is that there was some dependence on the base field k on the other hand if i include k into a larger field let's say l then i can naturally include the vector space kn plus 1 inside the vector space ln plus 1. Moreover, if I had a line in kn plus 1, then, well, it gives me something in ln plus 1. I can sort of tensor by L or consider uh, whatever it generates under L. In any case, it will be a line again. So I could have just taken one representative from the original line and just considered the line that it generates under L. Uh, therefore, the projective space pn over k will include into the projective space over L. And for that reason, these projective spaces behave very much like our circle from last week, in that the, there too we sort of realize that the circle should be treated in a way that is agnostic from its base field, and that it could be evaluated uh, at a field to get the set of points defined over that field or even over the ring of integers. Here, something similar is true, that the projective space should be viewed uh, in a field agnostic manner, so Pn without any decorations. And when we plug in a field, we get the corresponding points over that field, namely the lines in the space Kn plus 1. And most of what I will say here uh, will be to talk about the projective space Pn in a field agnostic manner. You can make this also slightly more elaborate. For example, we need not stick just to fields. Uh, you can think of what would Pn over the integers would be. In this case, the only change is that, well, you should say, I'm going to take one dimensional lattices, if you want, inside Z n plus 1. Now, not every element in this lattice will be a generator because you cannot invert uh, almost any number in Z. And so you have to take in Zn plus 1 primitive elements, so things that you cannot divide uh, by an integer, and you have to mod out by plus and minus 1 only. So that would be 
um, a way to get one rank one lattices in Zn plus one, and that's a natural generalization of what the z points of Pn would be. Structure works in even broader generality, and one might call Pn a functor or a scheme, but in this case, uh, we can continue to pretend that it's just uh, that we will just plug in eventually a field and consider the lines in a vector space. Now, in order to make this object a little bit more practical, we want to consider what's called affine charts. So this, in a sense, aids with computation, and moreover, it will open the way to projective closure of affinely defined objects. So the observation here is that when I have coordinates, so it's omega zero through omega n for a line, the following question makes sense. Is omega i zero or not? Right, so even though the coordinates themselves were not well defined, I'm only allowed to scale everything by a non-zero constant. Therefore, uh, if omega i was non-zero, then it will stay non-zero. And if it is zero, then it will always zero. So these are well-defined questions. The locus of lines where the i-th coordinate is not zero uh, is well-defined. If you take uh, this locus, it turns out clearly that this is an affine set. So you have n remaining coordinates describing this locus. For example, let's, uh, let's focus on the zeroth coordinate. Let's say the zeroth coordinate is non-zero. And then I can scale everything by the inverse of the zeroth coordinate, which means that you give me a line I, whose zeroth coordinate is non-zero. I scale by the inverse of this zeroth coordinate. And now I get one and then a bunch of other numbers. But these other numbers are now well defined because if you were to scale this coordinate, you will destroy the one I introduced at the beginning, and therefore I can undo your change and then recover my numbers. Now these n coordinates uh, following the zeroth coordinate are completely free to be whatever they want. So I have a kn inside this projected space, namely the locus where the zeroth coordinate is non-zero. Of course, I can do this for any of the coordinates. So the locus where the i-th coordinate is non-zero, usually this is denoted by, this locus is denoted by ui, uh, is an affine space, isomorphic to kn. Obviously, there are intersections between these uh, affine sets, but these n plus 1 affine sets, u0, u1, u2, etc., up to un, they cover the projective space. After all, at least one of the coordinates has to be non-zero. We can also go back uh, and start with an affine space, Kn, and I can inject Kn into Pn. So let's say we decide to use the uh, zeros injection. So I identify Kn with u0 by mapping a coordinate in Kn, let's say omega 1 through omega n, to the point 1, omega 1, omega 2, up to omega n, uh, the projective coordinates in Pn. Of course, this is well defined, and uh, I have this inclusion. Geometrically, this is also very nice. Uh, what you can think about is that in Kn plus 1, or now perhaps draw in Cn or Rn, uh, but in Kn plus 1, you can mark the point where the first coordinate is 1, and then there is a Kn inside, where the first coordinates are zero. Of course, this is no longer a vector space, but nevertheless, you can put it there. Uh, and what happens is that for any point in Kn, you go to the corresponding point by adding the first coordinate at the beginning, inside Kn plus one, and then you draw the line connecting this point to the origin. Of course, the infinite line. And now uh, this line is the corresponding point of the projective space. What you might see when you draw this picture is that as your point in Kn, again thinking with the real or complex fields, as this point goes over to infinity, the corresponding line that goes from zero to this point gets flatter and flatter. And one can imagine that at infinity, you get horizontal line. So a line that stays uh, in the, well, the vector space zero times Kn. And so this is indeed true. I mean, you can check this by switching charts uh, and observe that this is true, that limits 
uh, when working over CN, RN, uh, really do make sense. You can cancel uh, the offending term that goes to infinity when you switch to a different chart and things will converge. So that the projected spaces really are compact. From this picture, you can see this. And if you know the definition of proper, then the same argument will, of course, also work. Uh, cancellations occur that you can see everything converges when they're defined over a validation ring so that you can check properness. So I re recommend the as an exercise to show that P1 of the real numbers is a circle and that the P1 of the complex numbers is a sphere. For example, with the P1 of the complex numbers, we already know that there are two affine charts covering this. Both affine charts is going to be C of 1. So there are two complex planes covering this thing. And you will see that these two complex planes overlap uh, in such a way that their intersection is the complement of zero in both planes. And the zero of one, it becomes the infinity of the other. And so this uh, picture is a reasonable way to see that P1 of C is a sphere. So here's a, a bonus exercise. Uh, you can think of Pn of C as the quotient of a sphere. So in Cn plus one, uh, you just take a unit sphere. So it's a real sphere. It will have dimension two n plus one. And then uh, you will take an quotient to get down to Pn again. You will realize using the original quotient that we were taking of Cn plus one by C star, that now the quotient that you're taking is by the circle inside of C star, so elements of norm 1. So you realize that Pn must be the quotient of S 2n plus 1 by the circle S1. This is interesting for a couple of reasons, but for instance, when n equals 1 again, we realize that the sphere P1 of C is the quotient of the 3 sphere by S1. So this realizes S3 as a circle vibration over S2. This is called the Hopf vibration. This already is a, a very interesting construction, very elementary, but very interesting.